So for any of you have, who have met Nicole, her very presence is inspiring, right? And this is not something that just happened overnight. And I think it's really important for us to start with a visual and some footage that was taken when Nicole was only 14 years old for you guys to understand the kind of person that we're dealing with here, right? She has been blessed with this vision, this ability to execute a vision, this ability to kind of bring forth a vision in other people. And I really want you to, to let's just switch focus and we're gonna turn to these screens for you to see a vision that started from as early as any of you can remember. So we're gonna start with this video. If we can rewind it a little bit. My vision is big. I'm not here to come and, and smile. I'm here to smile, obviously. But I'm not here to just get up, eat, go sleep, get up, eat, go to school, go sleep, get up, eat, go to sleep, go to, go to work, go to eat, go to work, go to eat, buy nice things. There must be something else on earth that is for you. Paper and pencil is so out. To the people in my school, the computer is so exciting. And if they are interested in what they are doing. They will remember it. No tests needed. I mean, they will know. We don't want to put away books because books are important. Books are good because you can carry books around with you and read them. But I see, I see libraries having more computers than books, so to speak. My vision is to see technology centers set up so that children can have the same learning opportunities or can explore new technology because there are some children in Jamaica who have never even seen a computer. Times are changing, we're advancing, we're stepping, we're moving ahead. So if everybody is moving ahead, why is the education system still as it is? I mean, I think that they should be moving with time. We can't stay old forever. I mean, we need something new to excite children because we're really bored. <laughs> We know technology can make education better. We know it can teach so many things. We know the computer can teach so many things. But we don't want to get rid of teachers, do we? I have like three role models, but I have a really important one. His name is Mr. Bell, and he's my math teacher. But he's so much more than a math teacher, you wouldn't believe. To me, it's not about math. It's about life. He teaches about life. And sometimes when I do things, I say to myself, would Mr. Bell do this? And should I do this? And when I ask myself, would Mr. Bell do this? Sometimes I get the answer. You need the teachers. You need the teachers. And teachers like Mr. Bell just emphasize the need. Technology is good, but teachers, Mr. Bell is like unbelievable. When I think about what I want to be, I look at Mr. Bell and I say, well, this is what I would like to be. I'd like to marry a man like him. That's for sure. I see myself in a village, kind of, like a, like a village, like talking, as usual, <laughs> but I see myself talking to people, going to different schools sometimes or going to different places and speaking to children, speaking to adults, speaking to them, hearing their concerns. I want to be a people person. There has to be something more than material things. What's really important? It's what you have in your heart, it's what you think, it's what you say. It's how you relate to other people, that's really important. I'm not clear on my exact mission, but I can, I'm not clear on that yet, but I'll get there someday. I think kids should have have more of a say because 
even in the future, they're going to be the future. The generation now is becoming too caught up in material things and we have to look beyond that and say, okay, we're not on earth for these things. We're on earth to help people to change lives. Everybody has a different mission on earth. I believe that everybody has a different goal. It's up to you to discover what you are here for. And it's definitely not the clothes. It's not the clothes, it's not the shoes, it's not the jewelry. I mean, it's nice to have those things, but that should not really affect what you do or how you think. Right, so as you can see, she was full of bubbly passion, right? And this was 14 years old. And she said it so many times, I have a vision, I have a vision. And so many people in this world, we have vision, but that ability to execute that vision and bring it to reality, that to me is what this book is all about. And ever since I've known Nicole McLaren Campbell, that was what, that's what she has been blessed with. And not just blessed with, you know, bringing it to life for herself, but also seeing that potential in other people, people that she doesn't even know and have them bring their visions to life. And that to me is priceless. And without family, without the support of friends or family, where Rachel gone now? She does run gone. Then, you know, bringing vision to life is very difficult. You know, in this fast paced world, Nicole, as you said, is a mother, she's a wife, she is an entrepreneur. It's very hard to sit down and actually produce something and so we want to hear from her sister Rachel, who ran inside. You know, there's no Nicole without Rachel, right? <laughs> okay, so hi guys, how are you? I'm glad to see that everybody is here, and I'm glad that you guys turned out to celebrate my sister, who I myself am so in love with. Um, Nicole, let's see. Hmm. My earliest memory of Nicole is probably when we were in Barbados. And I don't know if my dad was having a birthday party or something was happening. But I clearly remember Nicole in the middle of the dance floor dancing. And everybody was like surrounding her, watching her, clapping and you know, and she was just like taking over the whole scene. That's how she's always been. Like she takes over everything that she does. Um, she talks, she talks at a million miles an hour because it's like there are so many things in her head, I think. This is my summation or my reasoning or confusion as to why she does that but I think there are a million thoughts in her head and she just wants to get them out <laughs> and I don't think that she can talk as fast as or how, how fast she talks can match the amount of thoughts she has in her head so she tends to just go on and on and on at like a million miles and more. Um, she's full of big big thoughts, big dreams, big visions and she never thinks there's nothing that she thinks is impossible from she was eight years old like i've never seen anything like that there's just nothing that she ever thought that she could not do it, it was just like the biggest things would just come in like don't refer to them and I, i'd sit there like you think you can do that and then and she would just be like oh, yeah. like nothing and just do it and get it done and that was just so amazing to me something that i always admired um um, in school, Nicole was always bullied <laughs> because she was somewhat of a nerd. And I was so, not a nerd. She, everybody, I mean, she would always be at the top of her class. You know, everybody wanted her to talk at all the school events and teachers' favorites and all these things. And um, so, because of that, she was bullied a lot. But I was there and I protected her. <laughs> but then when I left, and, and then when I left. She didn't really have any defense, so she suffered a little bit, but only for a year or so. Um, what else can I say about Nicole? Whew. Well, there's a lot. Okay. Um, one of the things I remember most, or I remember most clearly, is when Nickelodeon, this video was shot. Um, I, I was, she was 13, 14, 13 or 14, and that would have made me, what, Nicole, 10? So, Rachel, 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 Rachel. 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 Okay, I'm older than her. Okay. No, 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 no. Just, I was just about 16 or 15, thereabouts. And they came, Nickelodeon came, and they were so interested in her. I mean, it was just such a, like, they were so fascinating. And I, was, I remember looking on them like, 
she's just my sister. Like she's not that much of a big deal. Like what do you got? You know? Like what is it? But they were just so fascinated, and they came to the house. They filmed us having dinner thing, playing in the yard, and then they went to school and filmed her. And then there, there was another instance. I remember I had just gone to college, and um, I don't remember why, but um, People Magazine had this article out or this feature on the top 20 teams that are going to change the world. And so they featured people from Africa, Europe, all over the world, and Nicole was one. And they flew us all out to New York, and they put us up out there. That was a part I love. <laughs> They flew everybody out, me, my mom. I don't remember if Anya was there. No, Anya was there. Yes, yes, she oh, was, was there. there. Yeah, all of us. And um, went to New York and she went, there was this big dinner and she won this big award. Um, it was really cool. Um, it was kind of sometimes embarrassing in high school when well, as she tells me, she be in devotion, and of course, she's a teacher's favorite. And, and then sometimes, not all the time, but I'll have to go on stage for detention because, <laughs> as you know, giving a little trouble. <laughs> but you know, she was, she was, she would always tell me, Rachel, you just embarrass me, you embarrass me, but it was so cheap. Um, I know I'm kind of rambling, but I'm just trying to, to bring her to life for you guys to just, um. I don't know, kind of make her real, but, but she is, as you see her, she's as real as it gets. Um, and I'm so happy that she found my bill. He supports her every single day. I'm so happy for him because I think he really like pushes Nicole. It's like she, she's at this point you now where, where she's been so much growing up, it, it would be easier, easy for her to stop now because believe me, everything she has accomplished growing up, or everything she has done would be enough to push her to that next level now. But Jeffrey just doesn't ease up. Like he's always behind her, you know, fostering her and loving her and supporting her. And I'm really thankful for that. And I'm thankful for her three children. And her good friends that she has, she has few. What she does is steal all of my friends. <laughs> Except for Nicola here, who I've stolen. <laughs> Sharing, it's sharing. Okay, I'll, I'll, sorry, it's sharing. It's, it's just that you try to take Camilla. Okay, fine. Nicola and Camilla. But you share, I share with you more than you share with me. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So, anyway, um, I'd just like to say, Nicole, I'm very proud of you and I'm very happy for you. And I know this is just the tip 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 of the iceberg. And I'd like to raise a glass. Are the lips with me? Yeah, everybody has a glass? No? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Well, I'll soon. There is an imaginary glass. I'd like to soon. Let's, let's, let's soon raise a glass. Okay, so what else can I think about while we sit here and wait on the glasses? What did you think about the book? Oh, well, the book is just you. I mean, it's, it's a real life example, I think, of how you have managed to get to the point at which you are in your life. You know, um, from an early age, so that's the thing because a lot of the things you talk about, you've been practicing them organically from such a young age, and that's what I believe. It, it's it's it, a lot of it. I mean, we see a lot of the physical, and that's what we think it is it's physical, but we don't realize how much the mental behind it, how important that is, and how important of a driver that is. And I love the book because the book is true to life, um, real life experiences real life tips real life traits and real life what it takes to you know propel you and to keep you moving from one level to the next anything any other questions no <laughs> <laughs> okay okay well i don't know you're already <laughs> yes all right so we'd like to raise our glasses and we'll soon get some more glasses so for now let's raise our imaginary glasses or hold on to the glass of the person next to you. Yes. Here. Nicole, I just want to say I love you so much. And I'm so inspired by you and I'm so motivated by you every single day. And um, I thank God for you every day as I'm as my sister and my best friend. Here, here, here's Nicole. Um, thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. I'm really grateful. Before, I, the plan was that I come and talk about a couple of these things. I read a little bit about, uh, from the book and I, I'm going to do that. But 
I am so overwhelmed and so grateful that I have to start with thanking everybody even though that wasn't the exact plan. Thank you for everybody who came together to help this to happen to me. Thank you for the relentless nature of Camila McDonald. When I tried to swerve, hi Nicole, you? When I tried to swerve, I'm like, I don't need a book launch because of course, and fear is one of the big things I talk about in this book and I'm gonna read from that section of the book because it is something that is real. It is real for all of us in pursuit of our calling and our dream. And as we think about pursuing our callings or our dreams, we just feel this fear and it, none of us is immune, you know? And even having written this book and talked about how I've overcome fear and how I continue to stare, face, stare fear in the face and act, I still was afraid of doing this. Because I'm just like, Camila, it's not really necessary. I'm trying to pass it off as it's not really necessary when really I'm not afraid because I'm like, some people going come. And uh, you know, and, and so I want to thank every one of you, first of all, for being here. I don't take it lightly. I know that you could be many other places right now on a Tuesday at 6.30 when the traffic is way up there. So thank you very much. I appreciate every one of you. Thank you. I want to thank all of the sponsors. I know Camila is gonna thank them, but them turn up from Moe. My, my daughter has been going to French class and correcting me on my French. Okay, hi Yanni. I, so I said Notre Dame for our school and she said, Mommy, actually it's Notre Dame, you know, I learned it in French class. So anyway, I want to thank Moe, who is, who is, who is sponsoring the champagne tonight. Uh, it's really a celebration. I really want to thank Blueprint for the beautiful setup. I want to thank Fromage for allowing us to be here. This is everybody just coming together to believe in my vision. I'm really, really overwhelmed by it. I want to thank Jaden who is shooting the video. There are so many people who really just encourage me, support me, and you just, you just remember that no matter how confident you consider yourself to be when you're stepping into new territory, that uncertainty can attack and that old fear can come back even when you didn't think you was the boss and you could just have it locked. When you're stepping into new territory, the fear can come back and that's when the, the network of support around you becomes so meaningful and so important. So my unreasonable friend Nicola always just acting like everything is so matter of fact and of course everything goes sort of. Um, I really just want to thank, thank them and thank you guys for being here. So on the subject of fear, first of all I wanted to talk a little bit very briefly because it's in the book and I'm sure most of you have the book and, and most of you will get the book clearly. Uh, but why did I write this? Because I went to TVJ to talk about almost exactly 12 months ago. I went to TVJ to Smile Jamaica to talk about making the second half of 2016 count. Because of course, we're halfway through the year, as shocking as it may seem. I can't see, I can't believe it. I feel like it was just January. But this is the nature of time now. So I went to TVJ to talk about different strategies, ways that we can make the second half of 2016 count. And when I finished with the appearance, the security guard, when I was exiting, said, I really enjoyed watching you. I felt so inspired. Uh, where can I get your book? I was like, book? Oh, what do you mean book? So well, you don't have a book? She said, it's so matter of fact. She said, I'm so inspired by you right now, but I know when I go home, I would like something, you know, even tomorrow to, to, to hold on to, to read. And I said, but book? I don't have one and she just seemed so shocked and then I thought to myself maybe I do need a book. I kind of shelved it because again I was afraid but eventually push come to shove I just post on you know you know me named postmistress as my husband has dubbed me and what I decided to do Marlon you know it's true I just decided you know what I'm gonna just post the Instagram that I'm writing a book and this way it will keep me accountable. So I post and people are like, yes, yes, when is it coming out? And you know, I give them some vague answer, like it's soon come man, so like, and I just try to get myself into writing this book and I can't get myself into writing this book. And I know it was because of fear. Uh, but of course I tell myself I'm really busy. You know, you know we do that, right? We know it's fear, but we're busy. So we can use that as an excuse. Until I said, no, Nicole, you really, really need to sort out. So guess what I did? Open pre-orders. Yes, man, I said, pay for it. I said, yeah, man, you can pre-order. It's going to be released in January. And when people started buying the book now, like really spend their money, what, what choice did I have? I didn't have a choice because I couldn't like be a fraudster and scammer, right? <laughs> so, and I refused to be the loser refunding money like I can't finish a book. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to finish the book. So I finished the book. As you can see, this is the book. The book is about, what, 30, 38 pages. 
So then of course the fear is, Nicole, it's not a real book. You are not a real author because the book is so small. So I said, I said guys, it's just an e-book. <laughs> it's just a little e-book, you know. Um, yes, e-book. And so people start buying the e-book. So I said, okay, all right, cool, not making a big deal. And then a, a publisher randomly approached me, met um, while speaking at the Chamber of Commerce and says, well, why don't we publish the book? And I publish the book. Okay, what I do is I force myself to agree when I know something is right, even if I'm afraid, and then I can just cry after. That's what I did at my first, the first time I was called to speak at in front of a corporate audience. Sasko can tell you, Jeffrey, I cried the living eye water before I got to the speech and I said, Jeffrey, I can't call them and tell them. I said, they'll never think I'm lying, trust me. Because they won't think that he's afraid afraid. And he's like, what do you mean? Get up. And I'm like, oh. you know, couldn't you be more sympathetic? Anyway, so he scrapes me up off the ground and onto Scotia head, wiping the tears as, as, as I drive. Uh, in the parking lot, bawling again, fix up the makeup, pray about it and try to just go face it. And so that's what I did. When the man said publish, I said, sure. I acted like the most confident person there. And then when he leave, I say, what on earth? So I'm rolling with the punches and he says, let's launch it in Paris. And I said, launch it when? <laughs> Again, I move with it, I just go with it. And I have been simply overwhelmed by, it's so funny because the very things that I write about, I feel like this entire process, including tonight, is like teaching me at the same time. It's very strange. Um, so it's been like very emotional too because every time I feel the fear, after all, go back to the book and say, feel the fear and act anyway. Okay, all right. Yeah, man, publishing sort out. And, and I'll tell you this too, and I know two ladies from Fontana are here. The book is available exclusively in Fontana. And at first when, we, when, when I approached Fontana about distributing the book, I was told, you know, these things move very slowly. So just give us 40 for now. These things move very slowly. So I said, okay, here's 40. Then like within two days or a day, it was like, where, where are the rest of the books? The books are finished. People Instagramming, messaging like, where are the rest of the books? I sent everything that I have and then within days, everything was sold out. And the funny thing is when they were telling me on the phone, cause it's not like I make the fear or make me give up on my aspirations, you know. I feel the fear, but when they're talking to me and telling me how oh, books move really slowly, hear me in my mind now? Not my book. <laughs> they still call me back. That's what I'm saying in my head. And so when I, there are some things that happen that when they happen, I'm not even surprised. I just pick up the phone and I'm like, yes, you need more books. In my mind, I'm like, told you so. But I've just been very, very thrilled uh, about how the different stories that people are sharing. And we have a video just of a few, four little stories. But the, the most important thing to me is what it prompts, what it has prompted me to do and then what it has prompted other other people to do you know it needs action we can plan 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 till thy kingdom come we can have all the best intentions but if we don't move nothing happens so when people tell me they stood up at a at a conference for the first time to ask a question ever after going to a million conferences because they were always just too afraid or they found the courage to 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 request an interview with an upper level manager just because they really think they want this, this other job within the company and they would have never spoken up before. Uh, all these different things, you know, just, just movement in your life and realizing that everything you have is, is already inside you it has been very powerful for me. And so I want to read a little bit from chapter one of the book, which is on fear. How to get over fear is one of the most common questions I'm asked. It is a natural emotion and experiencing fear is part of what it means to be human. I have experienced fear and still do every time I decide to step out into uncharted territory, to take a risk, dream a bigger dream or ask a question I'm not sure of the answer to. I can't remember experiencing fear until I was about 13 when I was part of an online summit organized by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and was announced as the winner prematurely by my high school. I remember being terrified of not actually winning. I was afraid of what others would say or think and I was afraid of being embarrassed. I did end up winning, but somehow the fear of not accomplishing my big dreams and goals has never really left me since then. Still, I kept acting. 
When I was 15, I decided to apply to a competitive private college prep boarding school, Phillips Academy, to seek greater challenge academically. The stakes were pretty low. No one even knew I was applying. My parents didn't want me to leave Jamaica, and I wasn't 100% sure I wanted to leave either, so I was not afraid of getting in. However, when the courses were harder than I could have ever imagined, and the homesickness was like a heavy, thick blanket all around me, I became completely terrified of failure. With the college application process upon me almost as soon as I set foot on Andover's campus, I feared not getting into a prestigious university, a dream I had for myself for as long as I could remember, and what I knew so many friends and family expected of me. I feared not measuring up to the awesome talent I was surrounded by inside and outside the classroom. I questioned my worth as my safe identity as academic superstar, one nurtured and reinforced over my years in high school in Jamaica, came under severe threat. I didn't know the answers to the questions the teachers asked. I read and reread the textbooks, but just couldn't seem to grasp the concepts as quickly as I was accustomed to. Three months and many tears after arriving on campus, I was on the brink of giving up and returning to Jamaica. I prayed and prayed to God and felt deeply that I needed to dig deep, that somehow my ability to overcome and succeed at Andover would have far-reaching implications for my life. So I listened to him. I tried to block the fear out and focus on what I needed to do to be successful in this more challenging environment. What took others three hours to complete took me six hours, but I did it anyway with 100% of what I had to give. I decided I would need to focus on what I had, not what I didn't have. I knew that I needed to stop comparing myself to others and wondering why I couldn't have the talent in math another student seemed to have or the athletic prowess of another. I had to trust that I had unique gifts to offer the world. And even if I wasn't sure exactly what those gifts were, even if I wasn't sure exactly what those gifts were. After coming perilously close to throwing in the towel, I boldly applied to Princeton University early decision. I recognized and, and acknowledged my fear of not being admitted, a fear that was not helped by a college counselor who thought I was aiming way too high. I focused on success, I prayed, I visualized myself at Princeton, I promised, I prayed more, then filled out the application with the best expectations and full conviction. When I got in, I really understood the power of moving beyond fear, tuning out what others say about one's possibilities, and I got a glimpse of what not pursuing my dreams could mean for me. What I've also learned, though, is that if one does not continue to push against fear, even after major life lessons, like what I learned at Andover, fear can creep right back in our subconscious and limit action and possibility. I know this because when I landed at Princeton, I slowly but surely again became unsure of my place. Intimidated, intimidated by others I thought belonged there more, who were more talented than I could ever hope to be. I didn't go after opportunities, I just worked hard in my classes, but not much more. Ironically, my first encounter with real disappointment and failure, applying to the London School of Economics and not getting in, gave me the freedom I needed to find my fearlessness. How? Well, I failed and I didn't die. I got over it and I focused on the opportunities at the smaller, lesser known School of Advanced Study at the University of London. In the short year or less it took me to get my master's degree, I applied and received extra scholarships and jobs with the Commonwealth Institute and opened up myself to new experiences. How ironic that, the fa that failure freed me from the fear of it. why it's not going to work or why you could fail. The voice that starts to tell you all the other reasons why you shouldn't do something and why you don't really have to do it. You know the voice that tries to soothe you with that excuse that's perfectly reasonable. That tells you you have, you, you have done enough already man. Look at all the things you do already. You're, everybody, you know, you're already winning. No need to try that over there. Just relax right where you are. And, and the tightening in your belly where, you're, where you text Camille at 2 o'clock in the morning and say you're sure about this book launch? kind of thing that's what that's what fear is to me that tightening in your belly you can't breathe sometimes because it's just that bad um your heart rate accelerates 
and you just feel tight in yourself, like, ah! that's how I feel. So, is that little voice you? How do you distinguish the two? That's a great question. You want all of so the little voice, the little voice is always there and whenever I feel like I know it's the little voice when it's pulling me away from my calling, when it is pulling me away from an action that I know is bringing me closer to who I feel I am. So when, when I think about what I want to do in the world, which is to impact people and empower people, that's really the core. Everything I do at AIM with college advising is about empowering youth. Everything I do in the classroom is about empowerment. Everything I do online is, is about empowerment at the end of the day. And so if, so I knew it was fair um, and playing small when I was at the confer a conference last week with Kelly and I just was kind of afraid to talk about my book. I really was. This was last week. And she had to basically smack me. She gave me the slap down without like using physical violence. Like she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, you know, I was like, I have to text Rachel. I have to text Sasko. I'm like, oh my God. Uh, because the fear is what, what holds you back from, from full expression uh, according to where you feel called. And I felt called to write this book and I feel like the book has changed me and the book can change the lives of so many people. So at the moment where I feel like I feel nervous to talk about it or to call myself an author, I know that that's fear. I know that that's a little voice and that's not really me. And I have to share as well before I forget because everybody who know me knows that the forgetful thing way up there. Ginseng. But I want to share the other thing that I learned about right, through this process. You see this book? Again, 39 pages, right? So I tell you, it made me very insecure. Oh, by the way, you know, so the book they just have to done, right? Because, uh, you know, I was putting it off, afraid. And then I said, you know what? Publishing time. And I just go download the app, straight Google, I use, you know, how to publish book on Kindle. That's the search. Kindle, <laughs> Okay, Kindle. And I then I self-published the book and put it on iTunes, whatever, before it was even available in print, right? And I was insecure about the fact that it was only 38 pages. That was my insecurity. Do you know how many people have written to me? I can't even count to say the size of this book is what we love the most. Some people say I have not read a book since 2009 or years. One person said, oh, nine. That's eight years ago. Some people say, I can't tell the last day I read a book, I came out. And they, and they said, and, that's and, and they said no, that the reason that they felt not intimidated by the book so they could pick it up and buy it is because it was this length. So they're like, hey, I can do this. I may not have read in 10 years, but I can read this because it's only 38 pages. And I was most insecure about the, the size of the book. And that's what attracted people, a lot of people, the most to the book. And some people said, Nicole, I could read it in my lunch hour. And I felt like there was no going around. There was, it was straight to the point. It spoke directly to me. And I was finished. And I reread it three times. I go over and I highlight different sections each time. And I said, as I said, the very thing that you might be insecure about might just be your niche. It might actually be your gift. So I don't know if that had anything to do with the question, but I remember it randomly. I, I, so, so, so that little voice tries to tell you that you're less than. And I believe we were all born to greatness. We, we just are. We're, we're sons and daughters of the Most High, and that means in His image we are already great. But then the doubt and the little voice and the circumstances and the past failure and everything else, and we carry that around with us. And by the time we look, we're just in the safe zone. Anything, we're not risking any failure at all. And to me, it is a failure not to risk failure. Because if you don't risk failure, that means you're not doing anything. If, you're, if there's nothing in your life that you're afraid of within the next three to four weeks right now, audit, life audit, because it means you're not, you're not, there's something that you could be doing that perhaps you're called to that you're not doing, you know? And so, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Okay. Was it a good book? Was it a good book? What did you think about it? It was good. Yeah. What do you think about your mommy? She's very really nice. Aww. Aww. How has she guided you? Um, What's your favorite thing about your mommy? When she always helps me with stuff. Is there anything else you want to say? No. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome.
video, but one of the messages I got after somebody read this book is, Nicole, thank you so much for telling us about your failures, about when it didn't go well, because here we are watching you and things, and we think that you just have it locked, and everything is just always working, and you're just always winning. Absolutely not. And so I feel very passionately about bringing my authentic self, pop down and all, failure and all, everything else, um, to the fore, just to, just to, to really show that Everything we have is already inside us, and we are. In and if I don't act in the direction of that calling, then I'm doing a disservice not only to myself but a disservice to humanity potentially. Because this is a calling I think I was born to, and so it's really not about you. So at the end of the day, what do we fear? We fear embarrassment, the fear of not looking good, the fear of not being enough, the, you know, the embarrassment, what people will say if you pop down, etc. And at the end of the day, for example, you go in front of an audience, it, everybody who is sitting down in front of you, and, and Jeffrey would remind me of that, they're, they're coming there to get something. And you are coming there to give them something. So it's really not about you and if, if, if you sounded good enough or you looked good enough, it's about what are you there to give to people and to contribute to their lives. And if you think about it, I think the more and more we can think outside of ourselves is the better. So if you think about it in terms of this is the service that I'm giving to humanity, then it becomes less about you and the fear that consumes you now. You're just not afraid anymore, you know? And as you said, the courage to ask for what you want. And Camila will share this with you because I was sharing it with her. I had to approach Moe to sponsor this event. Moe, the champagne, Moe, to turn up. I had to, I, I, they could have well told me, um, no. You know, say it's 12 grand for our champagne for a bottle. They, uh, that would have been very, you know what I mean? I have to say, well, again, if they say no, I won't die. But I want this to be a nice event, a celebratory event. I want everybody to, to, to hear and to know about it, to ask, sleep, sleep. Can you come and, you know, and, and so yes, they could have said no, but they also could have said yes, and they did. Um, and nobody said no. And if I was there in the fear of, Lord, how I going to feel if them shame me? Then we said no, how she's so no fan thing, so we would have given her free anything. Oh, she's so beggy, beggy. Oh, she's so... No, I mean, guys, you know, there are so many things, so many times we want to ask for something, and we're just too afraid that we're not asking for it. How, if I never have the courage to say, to, to, because I, I sent the book to so, um, uh, many people, Crystal, Shanti, Yanni, Naomi, a lot of people who I know can reach a lot of people, the, the hot Stuart sisters, Nikoi, and I said, guys, I want to send you the book. Would you mind doing a review and sharing it with your followers? A lot of people would never even ask that because what? They're afraid to get book. Well, listen, I'm, 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 I'm bookable, but I will still be alive after you post me. I'm not going to say I'm not going to feel bad enough, but the thing is I don't melt and die. I'm still here standing, and the possibility of you saying yes is also there. But if I don't ask you and risk being book, then I get nothing. I'm not here in life to just get nothing or just be one of those take where you get kind of no 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 that was never on my radar that take where you get something there was never gonna be me so so I realized that you know ego getting over yourself being like it don't even matter this is your purpose this is what you're pursuing and you know what too the reading too reading books helps me to realize that the greatest of people have failed so who am I if Steve Jobs can fail and yet we have all of these great products. If, if J.K. Rowling can write Harry Potter, but before that get rejected 12 different times by publishers, then what am I doing? You know, if I'm not amassing some rejection and some failure, I mean, I'm not really doing nothing. And one thing I make up my mind, I'm not getting to the end of my life and looking back, and the reason that I never accomplished what I set out to is my fault. Make it be some other fault, but not mine. No means not no. That's what you're saying. Yes. Now, who is going to put their courage forward and ask a question? Yes. 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 We're, now in the, we're now in the time where we, you know, we just try it on. So who's going to try it on? Who has a question? Somebody must have a question. Introduce yourself. Hi. Good night, everyone. I'm Stacey Hines. So, uh, Mr. Bell, who taught me, started teaching me math from 11 years old, 13 years old, who really helped me to look beyond myself and think about what, why I was here in the context of the world. So that was a very important and, and formative 
influence for me. I would say later on in my life, I've had the benefit of having great mentors. One is uh, my uncle Glenn, then Christian, who uh, really believed in me when I had just only an entrepreneurial dream and really took me under his wing and pushed me. Um, Jeffrey, who is always scraping me up from whatever pop down might be occurring and helping me to see greatness in myself whenever I don't see it. And that's the same thing that my family does as well, my sisters, my parents. Um, and then, of course, when I met Nicola, was a totally, uh, when I met Nicola, was a, it was when I was one and a half years into business about, and I, I was tutoring, and I ended up tutoring her son, and she wanted me to drive all the way to Gordon Town, and I hated this woman. And I said to Jerry, who is this woman? She's so demanding, she's so horrible. I'm not going up there. I'm pregnant, this time I'm pregnant with Lauren. I'm like, what's I doing driving so far? I'm gonna get tired. And I keep trying to coax her to come down, and she's like, no, 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 it has to be at my house. And I'm just like, ugh. Anyway, Jeffrey is like, what are you doing? Go on. And I'm like, okay. So I drive there, I listen to the man. The man tells me what to do. So I drove and I went up there and and it's been completely unforgettable, the, the, the relationship that we've built because she has forced me to be uncomfortable and unreasonable with my expectations for myself. You know, sometimes you can know things, but you need somebody there who is completely just like, what you mean you only, what, like, uh, she's like, so home, one year she was like, how many students do you have in your college placement program? I was very proud of myself because I'm just building business. So I said, well, I have 25. Really, it was like 23, but you know, 25 is so wrong. So I said, I'm okay, little. So I said, oh, 25. Oh, you need to double that by next year. And I'm like, God, why you send this woman to in my life? She's just so horrible. And how on earth she expect me to do that? And show, and like I get vexed at first, you know. But then when I reflect on it, I say, you know, say it's true. And I just set my mind different. She forced me to move my mind to a different place whenever I'm thinking small. And I don't even know I'm thinking small until she said something totally unreasonable. I open my mind up to it. And by the next year, I have more than double the students. And I'm like, this friendship done up. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, just the, just the influence of people like Yannick, the influence of people like Daniel Ball of Odetta, just there, you know, always strengthening and reinforcing me and showing me greatness. And it's just you know, being inspired by, by you and just that, you know, uh, just women around me that really just drive me. So I can't really single it out. Just everybody has a different role, you know, Camila and Rachel and everybody, everybody. All right, um, second and last question. So um, you have a pretty full life. You have, you know, big family and lots of friends and husband, children, you're an entrepreneur, <laughs> now an author. Um, what would you pass on necessarily say advice because some people don't like that word, but maybe recommendations for others who have big lives and want to birth a dream. Oh, well, I think, and I said this and I, I don't have a problem repeating it because if, if there's something we can all leave with, I want this to be the reinforcement that everything you have is already inside of you. Everything, sorry, everything you need, everything you need is already inside of you. So if you have, and, and how I like to look at it and why I like to read and expose my mind because you don't even know. You know, when I gave the example of Nicola, it's just to show you that you don't know how limited you're thinking until somebody else exposes you to an idea that's bigger than how you've been thinking. And you say, box cover, I was thinking in a really limited way, but I had no idea because Kill Me Dead me is a big thinker, right? And so I think it's important to read. I think it's really important to get exposure to people who are further ahead on their journey than you are, or so in some way. I think that's really, really important. So I look to people like a Marcia. I look to people who really uh, can inspire me in that way. And so, you know, when you look at them, you say, but if they can do it, just try on the possibility that if other people can do it, nothing is stopping you from doing it. And that's what I like to, I look around me, I read books, I look at, and I say, there is nothing that is stopping me from achieving this result, except maybe they're using a different strategy, maybe they have a different toolkit, perhaps they have a different mindset. There are things that they are doing that maybe I'm not doing, but I can learn to do them. That kind of growth mindset, that whatever you don't know how to do now, or you're not good at now, you can become good at it. You know, and, and when you believe and vibrate on that wavelength of possibility, you realize that it's all possible. It's just up to you to actually take the step to overcome the fear and the fear of bite you 